Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language, writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a meaty middle about writing about quantities and a listener question about a phrase that we're hoping you've heard. Maybe you can help. Many writers and speakers toss quantities around with great imprecision. How many, though, is many authors and speakers? How great is great imprecision? In casual conversation, we might toss around quantities with reckless abandon. Our intent might be to emphasize or de-emphasize a preponderance of something. Consider the word majority. In an election, a true majority means one vote or more over 50% of the voters. That's different from a plurality, the highest total or percentage in a contest of three or more candidates. For example, if candidate A got 13% of the votes, candidate B got 47%, and candidate C got 40%, candidate B wins with a plurality of 47%. And if you're really good at doing math in your head and you're wondering why those numbers don't add up to 100%, Mickey Mouse got some write-in votes. He always does. Moving on, most of the time you can write or say most rather than the majority of. It's quicker and clearer. When precision counts, as in the election we just mentioned, it's best to make it clear whether you mean majority or plurality. Often, and again, how often is often, we talk about small numbers of people or things. Still, that can be vague. Is several more than or fewer than a few? What about quite a few as opposed to quite few? Is a bunch less than a lot? Fortunately, we have modifiers that make things even more nebulous, approximately, about, around, and good old roughly. And if you're talking about an approximate date and want to make an academic impression, you can dust off circa, a Latin word that means roundabout. Latin scholars love that one. Those do come in handy, however, when the alternative is to make a flat-out guess. In A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, Pseudolus asks, How many geese in a gaggle? Aronia shrugs and says, Seven? A light dawns on Pseudolus, who then sends the old man on a journey, seven trips around the seven hills of Rome. Such is the price of precision. As for some and any, these two stand alone as vague qualifiers. Compare, Do you have some sense about what's going on? with, do you have any sense about what's going on? The second is a little insulting. The words you nincompoop are implied at the end. Do you have any sense about what's going on, you nincompoop? Now, when some or any is used in a compound word, the implication offered or the inference drawn can vary. Drop by sometime or drop by any time. In those examples, any time is more inviting. How much more? Well, you know, a bit more, a little, a jot, an iota, a tad more. And what about a couple? A couple is two, except when it's not. We'll be back in a couple of minutes, Squiggly and Aardvark might say. Go ahead, count out 120 seconds and see whether they've returned. Also, on the subject of time, how long is a while? We can modify that word with even more vagueness if we want, a little while or quite a while. Meaning what, exactly? He's been gone quite a while now. Three hours? A fortnight? A decade? Yep, quite a while. Okay, then. Thanks heaps for clearing that up. Obviously, it's not only Albert Einstein who believes time is a relative concept. As for a little while, there are lots of expressions for that. The blink of an eye, nothing flat, a moment, an instant, a flash. There's also a trice and a jiffy. Under British standard measurement, there are 12 trices in a jiffy. However, a metric jiffy has 10 trices. That last part is completely made up. Speaking of fiction, in the movie Pulp Fiction, characters employ two quaint coinages for a brief passage of time. In one, Mia promises Vincent she'll join him in two shakes of a lamb's tail. In another scene, there's this exchange. Butch says to Fabian, have a nice breakfast. I'll be back before you can say blueberry pie. Fabian, not wanting him to leave, blurts out, blueberry pie. Butch says, well, maybe not that fast, but pretty fast, okay? 
Other imagery can convey fleeting moments, a heartbeat, or a heart murmur, as some say. A New York minute, a tick of the clock, a split second. Longer terms, of course, don't get any more specific. Which is longest or shortest? An era? An age? An eon? A period? Or an epoch? Hmm, I guess only time will tell. As we've seen from the Pulp Fiction example, you can spice up your writing with clever or even nonsensical approximations, especially fiction writing. But if you're writing about sports, polls, election results, recipes, and other times when the quantity actually matters, stick with specifics whenever you can. That segment was written by Rob Rinalda, Robinson Prize Laureate for Excellence in Editing and founder of WordSAR Media. Before we get to our Familect story, today's episode received support from DoorDash. Whenever you want to treat yourself to an amazing meal from your favorite restaurant without leaving the house, you need DoorDash. DoorDash connects you to all of your favorite restaurants in your city. Just use the DoorDash app to choose what you want to eat, and your Dasher will bring it right to you wherever you are. DoorDash works with more than 310,000 amazing restaurants in over 3,300 cities across the U.S. and Canada. They have local go-tos in all your favorite chains. So no matter what you're hungry for, it's easy to get it fast with DoorDash. With DoorDash, dinner comes to you. And now you can get $5 off your first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code GRAMMAR. That's $5 off your first order when you download the DoorDash app from the App Store and enter the promo code GRAMMAR. Again, that's the promo code GRAMMAR for $5 off your first order from DoorDash. And now here's a combination of a Familect story and a request for help. Hi, Grammar Girl. This is Annethy from Ohio, and I'm a longtime fan. I have called to share my Familect word in hopes that someone else may be familiar with the phrase and can shed some light on a solid definition. When I was a little girl, my parents used different phrases when telling me it was time to go to sleep. Mommy would tell me it was time for Beaky Show. I have no idea how to spell this. It could be one word, two words, or hyphenated. I kind of think it might be spelled as B-E-K-I-S-H-O-W. I understood what she was telling me to do. However, one day I asked her what it meant. She told me she didn't know, only that her mom said it to all her children. In my childhood mind, I believed it meant to go to bed, closing your eyes, and let the movie in your mind roll. Back in my parents' day, they didn't say going to the movies. They said going to the show. If anyone has heard of this phrase, I'd appreciate some feedback. Bye-bye. If you've heard this phrase or know what it means or where it comes from, please let me know. You can leave a message at 833214GIRL or tag me on Twitter or Facebook. I'm Grammar Girl on both. And if you'd like to share your Familect story, you can leave a voicemail at 833214GIRL and you might hear it on the show. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl and author of seven books, including the New York Times bestseller, Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing. And thanks to my audio producer, Nathan Sems. This show is part of the Quick and Dirty Tips podcast network, and you can find articles that go with each episode at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all. Thanks for listening. <laughs>